name is David. I work as a software engineer at iterative.ai. Uh, and this is live. It's not showing. So the idea here is that I will try to share with you what's MLOps, in my opinion, uh, because I don't think that there is a universal definition of MLOps, unfortunately. I think it's very dependent on the use case. So I will try to share uh, my experience and how I got into the MLOps world before joining Iterative when I was working as a computer vision researcher in a research center. So, uh, like I say, I, I was working as a computer vision researcher and we didn't care about uh, software engineering, best practices or DevOps. And MLOps uh, wasn't even uh, worth back then. But uh, eventually, I, um, our bosses started to worry uh, because the models we were producing were kind of a mess in order to be reproducible. Uh, it was the boom of deep learning in our defense. So we were struggling with the deep learning frameworks, implementing new architectures and trying to get the models to train. So we didn't have much time to worry about these kind of things. But as the, as the field of deep learning kind of started to consolidate, we could start paying more attention to the software engineering and the DevOps just practices. So uh, for some reason, I became a good candidate to uh, be the one in charge of embracing this new term called MLOps. So I tried to go around my colleagues, ask questions, and try to define what we need from this MLOps thing. So I asked around, I asked also to myself, uh, what's, what were the main pain points when we were developing models? And most of us uh, researchers agree that the main issue was that um, taking over a project from other researcher that has left the company, for example, it was uh, very cumbersome. It was very complicated to find all the configuration data model pipeline set up for a project. And this was co consistently happening across all projects for it doesn't matter if the researcher tries to actually make it reproducible. We didn't have uh, the tools. So when we were discussing what we want from MLOps, this was the first goal that we would like to cover. And then there was like the extended version of this, that it would be great if this whole manual process of generating models could be automated somehow. Ideally, uh, if I go on vacation one week and new data arrives, uh, the model could be trained easily or even automatically without manual intervention. So researchers can focus on doing the actual research uh, instead of manually triggering pipelines. So we have uh, our goals clear, but now we need to we needed we needed to implement this. So we started the quest of exploring uh, the different MLOps tools around. The first thing we jump into uh, were um, these cloud providers and end-to-end -end machine learning platforms by um, Azure, Google, or Amazon Web Services. And it makes sense that, uh, to be the first thing we try because we were already customers of these cloud providers for other things, mostly for managing uh, software engineering and stuff, but also for hosting data. So the problem I found, uh, I personally uh, found with these uh, solutions were that they isolate the research from the software engineering stack or of tools. And ideally I would like that, I thought that MLOps would be a nice way actually to make researchers closer to the software engineering world, not isolate them further, which we were already very isolated. Uh, it was, in my impression, there was also kind of overkill for many projects. We have some projects where it makes sense, this scalability, but we also have like a lot of prototype or proof of concept projects where this setup was completely overkill. And the issue we found is that these platforms, uh, it's not easy to opt out for some of the features. It's like you pick one platform and you have to buy the full pack. 
and then uh, mostly because it's their business model uh, once you start building around your stack around one of these cloud providers it's very easy to switch it's very hard to switch to other one or even i uh, integrate so an alternative to this is to go and explore uh, sorry my next slide yeah go and explore the open source uh, ecosystem of MLOps tools and uh, the issue we found is that this uh, a really vast ecosystem with a lot of tools there is no clear path uh, for there is no explanation of which tools do you need for your use case how to connect those tools so we were dancing around trying different tools and trying to figure out how to connect them it was not a very pleasant experience and i think the ecosystem nowadays is still kind of the same there are five tools uh, doing pretty much the same thing for every single part of the melops and this is a not very pleasant experience for users so we took a step back and i went to the devops team which we have as part of the company and asked them okay if you do devops for software engineering who seem to have all this figured out uh, why cannot we apply the same tools for our machine learning projects and uh, most of the answers were um, very similar i am quoting here a blog post by balohai uh, which uh, states the difference between uh, devops or, and mlops and the main point is that uh, in machine learning you actually need to version uh, data parameters and models in addition to code uh, whereas in devops traditionally you only need to version the code and usually these um, tools used for software engineering like github or git are not, are not suitable for versioning uh, large artifacts or parameters or uh, models so um, we found this tool which uh, now i work on which is called dbc data version control which is uh, which is focused on covering this gap by extending the power of git and github so it allows you to track large artifacts while still uh, use using your so traditional software engineering stack then the second point was that we were training computer vision models which are uh, pretty uh, hardware uh, demanding and usually in the ci cd world the machines are not powerful enough uh, for this kind of uh, task so we also uh, by the same company that i work now work on which is called iterative.ai there was this other solution called cml or continuous machine learning which allows you to inject a powerful cloud instances as part of your ci cd workflow so the training of the model can be detached and launched in a powerful cloud instance with gpus for example or multiple gpus and you can still orchestrate and manage the workflow through the ci cd uh, stack like GitHub, like github actions all right so usually i use this material for a in-person workshop and uh, there are two links here for the initial version of the workshop where there is nothing done and there is also a complete solution so i'm going to go through the slides showing uh, all the steps of the workshop but if afterwards you want to fork the uh, link at the top and try to follow the steps yourself um, and you have the link at the bottom with the final uh, solution the idea that i wanted to showcase um, in this project was um, a prototype for an automatic UC issue labeler so i work on the dbc repo and we have uh, a lot of issues being open every day and we have to manually assign labels uh, to triage them to organize so it sounded like a cool project to have a, a machine learning model that takes the issue title as an input and can output one or predict one of the labels that uh, we use to categorize the, the issues 
The idea is that we are going to manage everything in a single repository. On the left, we have the data source, which in this case would be the DBC repository, when, from which we are going to fetch issues uh, with the title and labels assigned in order to build the data set. We are going to use the tools uh, that I mentioned before, DBC and CML, to build this minimum MLOx workflow around GitHub Actions. Then we try a hugging face model. And um, at the end, we are going to pack the model inside the Docker image that can be deployed anywhere. And as an example, we are going to deploy it as part of a GitHub workflow that can automatically assign a issue, a label to an issue. So the initial state of the whole workshop, uh, the, the one that is already included in the, in the non-solution repository, uh, allows us to have what I call local reproducibility. So this is basically that something works on your machine. So as long as you have access to your machine, uh, everything works. In this initial version, we have a DVC pipeline, uh, which is just a connection of stages uh, depending on the dependencies and outputs. It looks like this. Uh, we have an initial stage called get data, which gets the issues from the DBC repository and builds and store them in, in a format suitable for training. Then we have a split into training and validation steps yeah, and into training and validation splits. We train with the training and validation and we evaluate with the test split. So what I like originally from the, the DBC pipelines um, I, is that they are non-intrusive they are defined in a YAML file, but you don't have to alter your code, um, your the code of your stages. So you have an in, at the top level you have a field called CMD where you indicate what you want to execute execute as part of the stage. In this example repository, we are uh, always running Python scripts because just is the thing I like. But the flexibility of DBC is that in this CMD, you can actually call any CLI tool uh, and you can mix, mix in the same pipeline. You can run Python scripts, run arbitrary CLI tools, um, whatever you want, without how to modify the actual Python code in this case. And the way uh, DBC builds the graph of stages is by indicating dependencies and outputs. So you uh, tell DBC that there is a file or a folder that you want to consider a dependency of this stage, and you only the file that this state stage is going to write. So after you did this, so to indicate to multiple stages, DBC builds the graph that we saw in this slide based on the disconnection of dependencies. This is how DBC allows to build a pipeline uh, without actually requiring you to include any code in your existing stages. There's also some additional machine learning features, this kind of special outputs called metrics and plots that are useful for DBC to later uh, rendering. So having the pipeline, if uh, I am on my um, machine, I can run this uh, command called DBC experiment run, and I can even modify parameters on the fly. And because I have a local uh, DBC cache, DBC actually checks if some of the dependencies have changed or not. So in this case, the two first stages ha don't have any changes. So DBC is going to skip the stages and just retrieve the outputs from the cache but because I modified the parameters that affect the training stage, DBC actually recomputes the training stage and the evaluation stage. So this is how it looks, uh, a high level diagram of how is this local setup. I have my code and I have some special metadata files that I track with Git. So I can run Git pull and Git push commands. And I have a local cache that's why I can reproduce the pipeline locally, where DBC actually stores the big data, the big uh, data files. 
and it maintains a link between the metadata and the actual files. The problem is that I can run git push to share the metadata and the code, but I am missing a way to share these big data files. So this is the next step that I call uh, shared reproducibility. Um, before that, after you have set up all this uh, DVC pipeline, we just launched this uh, free extension for Visual Studio Code, where these special outputs that were in the stage like metrics and plots can be actually rendered as part of the Visual Studio Code UI. And you can uh, run experiments from the, from the Visual Studio extension. It's pretty much a wrapper of the DVC CLI, but it has a nice dashboard and features uh, without requiring you to launch an external server. This can uh, this just works on your machine using the DVC artifacts. So now um, jumping into this next stage, which is called shared reproducibility. So what we need to do uh, in order to fill the gap that we have before is to include this thing called DVC remote. A DVC remote can be an arbitrary uh, cloud storage uh, that allows you to run these new commands called DVC pull and DVC push. So you can pretty much mimic the workflow you were following with Git, but uh, now you additionally need to run DVC push and pull to actually fetch uh, or get the large artifacts from the remote storage. And setting up a remote storage can be uh, as simple as you want, and the commands are the same, uh, no matter what, which cloud provider uh, you choose as remote storage. One of the simplest ones is uh, you can actually create a Google Drive folder uh, in your Google Drive, and you can add uh, that folder as a, Google, as a DVC remote running the commands at the bottom of the screen. So just by adding that, uh, running that command and creating that folder, uh, DVC is already able to use this uh, Google Drive folder as a remote storage. So if researcher A in his machine runs this new experiment uh, increasing epochs to 12 and actually tracks the changes with Git, it can now also run DVC push to get these large artifacts, the data set and the model, and put them in a remote storage. So researcher B, when clones uh, this repository or pulls these latest changes, from Git is going to retrieve the code changes and the metadata changes, and DVC pool is actually going to get these large artifacts, the corresponding the, that are associated to these metadata files, and going to retrieve them from the remote storage. So now, people from different machines can share not only the code and the small files, but also the large files. And these uh, commands work the same uh, for all the remote storage. So you can also use the Amazon S3 bucket, Google Cloud bucket, uh, wherever you want. So going even further, um, why not use GitHub where we are tracking our code and our metadata files to actually run uh, the experiments. And as we mentioned before, the issue is that if we train really large models, uh, the machines that GitHub Actions, for example, provide might not be powerful enough. So CML provides you this utility called CML Runner. And the way you use it is that you insert a, pre a step in your GitHub Actions workflow called CML Runner that can trigger um, can create a new cloud instance in any of the major cloud provider, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Uh, you can set up, uh, you can customize which kind of machine you want, and then the rest of the workflow um, can pretty much do the same steps that you are going, that you would be doing locally, but instead of running locally, now it would be running in this cloud instance that CML has taken care of creating and will take care of shutting down after the subsequent steps have ended. 
and if there is a failure, uh, the instance the instance can also get uh, shut down. So we are pretty much using the same tool, uh, GitHub Actions Workflow in this case, that we use for testing and linting our code, but now we can also use this tool for training our machine learning model. After we have added this um, workflow in our repository, we can create a PR updating some of the parameters and CML is going to run uh, all these steps. CML is going to create the cloud instance uh, as a first step and then it's going to run this DBC pool, DBC experiment run and DBC push commands on that machine, which is pretty much what we did locally. And it's going to take care of creating a PR with all the uh, metadata files, all the files tracked by Git. And it also provides some utilities to actually generate reports of the experiments and post them as GitHub uh, uh, comments, uh, which is the screenshot that I show on the right. So this is all happening uh, through GitHub uh, or GitLab orbit bucket, by the way. Uh, CML works the same for any of the um, GitHub Git providers. Uh, we also provide this um, free to use up to five or two users. I don't remember. I think two users, which is called Studio. It basically allows you to connect your GitHub repository to this uh, SaaS called Iterative Studio. And this uh, provides you a high level overview of your repository. Uh, recognizing these special metadata files for DBC, like the parameters metrics and DBC track files. And it also allows you to trigger new experiments from the, from the UI. So when you click on run a new experiment, it's actually going to create a PR on the GitHub uh, repository that you connect. And that PR is going to trigger the workflow that we define at the beginning of this section. It also uh, allows you to compare different commits after you have been iterating uh, with different hyperparameters, for example, trying the number of epochs. Uh, this iterative studio, similar to how you can render the plots and metrics locally with the Visual Studio extension, you can do the same here, do, do the same here in the website um, um, in a more uh, shareable way because you can actually share this view with your colleagues. So yeah, this is Iterative Studio. Uh, so this is cool. We are now even training our model in GitHub. Uh, everything is online. Anyone with access to the GitHub repository can trigger a new experiment, but we are missing uh, the step of deploying. Um, usually when when I was working as a computer vision researcher and we find like the next good iteration of a model, we uh, either grab the model in a Docker container and wait for someone to, for the de from the DevOps team to come to deploy it. Or uh, we, we actually did uh, some crazy stuff, sending the model through Gmail or <laughs> Slack or something like that. So, uh, in the repository, we can actually do the first same step, which is building a Docker container that wraps the model with an inference script. The interesting part here is that we are copying the actual model inside the Docker image, right? So because TBC with the remote storage allow us to pull and push uh, these big data files, Inside a GitHub action workflow, I can actually run DBC pull command to get the model. So I can reuse this um, popular GitHub workflow for building and deploying Docker image. And I just add this additional step where I am actually getting the latest version of the model from the DBC remote that one can, uh, that could be pushed by someone locally or could be pushed by this pull request workflow that we added. Uh, it doesn't matter because the workflow works the same. So this workflow is going to build a Docker image. It's going to publish the Docker image in the GitHub Docker registry as part of the 
uh, as part of our GitHub repository, we can host uh, Docker images. So if we pick this workflow and include in the repository, every time a new commit gets added to the main branch, for example, when a new PR gets merged, this workflow is going to be triggered, it's going to fetch the latest model that is pushed in the DVC cache, and it's going to create a Docker image with the latest model available for anyone to use. So you no longer have to wait for this a slow process of having of having to share the image with someone manually. And as an example uh, of, of how you could use this image, uh, as part of the workflow, I, I create this uh, yet another GitHub Actions workflow that whenever a new issue gets created, is going to pull the Docker image from the from the main branch, so the latest version, is going to run inference over the issue title, and uh, it's going to uh, store the result in a JSON, and then we just did some little trick to parse the JSON and actually automatically assign the label. So if you go to the solution repository and you create a new issue uh, with an example title like this one, uh, a GitHub Actions workflow is going to try to fetch the latest version of the model, predict a label, and automatically assign it. So this is just to showcase an example of how you could deploy a model, but depending on the project, you could do it uh, the way you want. For me, the important part is that thanks to the DBC remote, I can actually reuse this workflow traditionally used for building Docker images, and I can insert an additional step to retrieve interesting artifacts from, from the DBC remote. So with that, the model is deployed. And the last step is just that because we are using GitHub Actions workflow, we can exploit the capabilities that they offer for orchestrating and triggering actually workflows. So the workflow we added in the online reproducibility step was either manually triggered or triggered when a new PR gets created. But we can also use the GitHub Actions features, which provides a cron job to automatically trigger uh, a workflow on a schedule. So if we have this, um, we pretty much copy paste the same pipeline that we are using in the online reproducibility, but we tell GitHub to trigger this workflow at the end of it, at the beginning of its day. And then uh, we can also use uh, these features uh, by DBC Experiment Run, where you can modify parameters on the fly to actually update a parameter. So in this workshop, I have two parameters, data since and data until, to control the uh, boundaries of the dates to fetch issues from. So what I am doing here in this automated workflow is that at the end of each day, I am going to trigger and train a new model, which is going to use a new data set because it's going to fetch issues not only from the from the uh, previous boundaries, but it's going to increase the boundary of until to the current date. So every day I'm going to fetch the latest issues from the GitHub DBC repo. I'm going to train a new model with a new data set and the whole um, other steps like creating a PR, generating a report are also triggered automatically. So I can decide if I want to merge uh, this workflow or not into the main branch. I could even automate the ranging, the merging, by checking if the accuracy has surpassed some threshold. But uh, yeah, I don't want all the research to be fired, so it's still good to have a manual step of verifying if the results are actually better or not. And this was actually faster than I thought because I think I have finished and I can share uh, quite a few links um, for helping you. So please uh, don't hesitate on ask, asking any questions. I will try to answer.